privilege of having the final grunt in this series. Uh, I, I gather a retrospective grunt is called, is called for. Um, but I'd first like to deal with the title, and probably um, Chris, Mike, and Jeremy have all made comment on how we acquired this rather dubious title of the grunt group. When I was in North America, uh, uh, building a building bar, I realized the term grunt bar was in common usage. I mean, people would talk about one of the grunts in the other room getting the drawings out. And suddenly, uh, Peter's uh, title first fell into a perspective that uh, wasn't immediately apparent to me when uh, we received it. Um, but I also couldn't uh, not observe in um, David's poster that we never had such publicity. I mean, the word right has never been printed quite so large in typographical terms. Um, in, in the issue of AD circa 1972, it was extremely small. It was in a kind of sub, in a subtext that Milton wrote uh, as technical editor of the AD at that time. Um, but maybe titles and labels are ultimately retrospective. Um, and certainly when we were working together with the four of us, uh, we realized we had a fraternity, but we didn't see ourselves so explicitly as a group. And to that end, a group that might set up a poster and uh, have four speakers to it. Um, As has been said, the actual title was bestowed upon us by London's air traffic controller, Peter Cook, um, coincident with the publication of our work over the period 65 to 70, that was uh, the period that we worked for McManus and Partners, um, under the generous, and one might say nearly saintly patronage of Brian Smith who was the senior partner. I feel another acknowledgement is due on this occasion of pulling us out of uh, the dusty, a, a dusty period of history. It was Monica Pigeon, whose initiative it was as editor of the AD then to publish our work. I think Monica had an unofficial policy of wishing to reveal the actual architects behind the um, corporate face of architectural practice. Um, it may or may not be true that Warren Middleton, who was then the technical editor, had felt a need to subvert uh, Monica's enthusiasm for the new coup uh, by the inclusion of the late Walter Siegel's carping and I think moralistic essay in the titled The Neo Pure School of Architecture, and I quote, An unbridgeable gulf separates us now from La Saraz and its men, Siam. They are the past. The voice of Puritan in the 1970s sounds hollow, and Puritans really make us feel uncomfortable. We care tuppence for its purity. We need to look at the 20s, the 30s, the 50s, and the 60s as history. Our problems and preferences are no longer theirs, and we must turn to them, if at all, with fresh minds. Well, dear Walter, and as I mentioned to David as we were upstairs before coming down to this occasion, we are now as removed from 1964 as you were when you made those comments. There's a strange symmetry that David's mentioned that 1964, you go back 30 years, you jump World War II, and you're into Smithson's heroic period of modern architecture. I find in the context of this talk, this is a very sobering um, moment of show and tell in that one feels perfectly alive and uh, capable of another 30 years work, but um, rather I think 
Robin Milton, notwithstanding his later celebrity as historian and a very fine one, was at the time a card-carrying member of, of uh, Archigram, and one might observe uh, a certain kind of, uh, how can I say, um, provocation between groups of people trying to make buildings at that time. The time then passed into general, into general architectural sub subculture. And five years later, in 1977, uh, air traffic controller once more as guest editor for A Plus U, which he edited on the title Unbuilt England. <clears throat> in his essay, a marvelous essay, a marvelous essay um, called Unbuilt England, its structural background, um, Cook sketches a remarkably lucid view of English influences, schools, movements, etc. And I would say it's essential reading for anyone who is a student of the post-war scene. Of ourselves, Peter writes, and I quote, the grunt of the grunt group, generally assumed to have in the clue Crystal Cross, Mike Gold, Jeremy Dixon, and Edward Jones, were therefore giving a grunt of seriousness and aestheticism it had its origins in the, in, in the actual threatening noise made by some of its members and their generally quiet English manner. Consistency and dedication to aims certainly did mark them off from the rest of the strip at this time. Peter referred to the strip, I think, is to do with, um, in his air traffic control mode, is a piece of tarmac that goes from the uh, Polytechnic School of Architecture and Bedford Square uh, sort of noticing the Bartlett on its way. David Wilde also uh, was a commentator at this time, and in reference to the AD in the wake of the Siegel controversy, observed that we as a group had a distrust of plush chat in the service of crummy building. Maybe enough about the title as to our backgrounds. We were all born, as Jeremy mentioned last week, in 1939. We all went to minor public schools. We were all trained at the AA, very, very, between 1959 and 63. You might say, for nice middle class boys. And as Jeremy pointed out last week, with the exception of Chris, we lived in the same house for a short time in number seven, Doughty Street, opposite Dickens. Although we were variously in the same year, we never worked together, that is, at the AA until later. Um, our studio teachers, amongst others, were Robert Maxwell, Kenneth Fountain, Alan Kerr-Yahoon, Cedric Price, David Gray, and Peter Smithson at a distance. We were never taught by Peter that his influence was profound. That's quite uh, a gallery of modernist worlds, if you ever had one. At the same time, Baron uh, was giving lectures on the modern movement for us. There were drafts of his um, can canonical uh, theory and design in the first machine age. And Summerson, just for light entertainment, was lecturing us on the 18th and 19th century architecture. It could be said that during this period we could not see beyond the whole horizon of modern architecture. There was no other prospect. <coughs> um, maybe I should put some slides on. Do I just press some buttons? Which ones do I press? There are more buttons to press these days. Those ones. Okay. Okay. Also, the four of us was interesting. Uh, it was a period of pop, of pop groups, and I, I think it was a mild modeling of the style of pop groups. And before we set up in practice, we did attempt to give ourselves a name that 
failed and Peter did it for us. During this period, we could not see, as I said, beyond the horizon of modern architecture. And the devastation of World War II was followed by a massive rebuilding program and its uneasy celebration of 1951 at the Festival of Britain on the left produced the early polemics. of Team 10. Smithson's Golden Lane project on the left and uh, a collage of the Golden Lane project laid over the bombarded city of Coventry on the right. Both these I images come from an incredibly influential tiny book, Upper Case, which dealt with the Smithsons and their work in the East End of London with Wilmot with and Young. Um, this was the independent group days. This was when Smithson, Allison and Peter and Eduardo Pelazzi uh, contributed their uh, brutalist primitive hut to This Is Tomorrow exhibition at the Whitechapel. I would say that this period and the work of Team 10 acted as, our, as the architectural compost for a generation. The total rejection of values of the Festival of Britain is typified by the illusory townscape drawings by Gordon Cullen and Kenneth Brown that seem to be setting the provincial architectural climate in England at this time. Smithson's famous aphorism, Mrs. is great but cool, communicates, was a call to arms, a, pro a provocation to get into better company, to judge one's work by world standards. Um, many journeys and pilgrimages were to follow um, to Max Bohm's Hochschule for Gestalten und Um on the right, <coughs> um, Ontario Files, Sigmund Harlan and Byrne on the left. Um, most of Dyker and Bathurst's work in, around Hilversum and, and Amsterdam. This is the open air school on the left, suitably covered in sort of the dust of time. I think that slide was taken by David Wilde, and on the right is Rietveld's Schroeder House. And almost all Corbs extant European work. Mostly driven to in antique Porsche cars, I think only Jeremy resisted the appeal of Dr. Porsche. Uh, I think he drove, uh, um, what did Jeremy drive? I think he drove the Deshaver, the Deshaver. Chris, Mike, and myself uh, drove one of these numbers, a 356B. And, you know, they appeared in Max Bill's book on good fun. We were also eating off and drinking off a student thesis at the time from Bill's Hochschule for Gestalten at Ulm, uh, the crockery on the right. We were wearing American drip dry shirts and, and uh, Drip dry suits from Austin's in Shaftesbury Avenue and attended <laughs> movies of the Mingle Bog at the Academy in Austin Street. I'm very touched that uh, Jean Luc Goddard is showing at the AA in the coming week. The crockery was quite amazing. Uh, um, I noticed it in a magazine in the States in about 1961 as a thesis. And I often wondered that I could have gone into the kind of habitat business. We have to buy it wholesale. And uh, so the only way of getting the, the cup and the saucer was to distribute it to all one's friends in North London in a job, a job lot. Uh, anyway, enough of this cool nostalgia and back to the compost. The post-war 
building the enterprise, it's building models on mint Swedish vernacular, and some of the more recent production of Kwabu had a momentum that carried all before it. Whatever the successes and failures of this post-war reign regime, an agenda was given to schools of architecture. The national effort in public housing, schools, and university building gave students and schools the more material of their courses. I believe it was a combination of James Garn, John Killick, and Peter Smithson, who were responsible for the curriculum of the AA at this time. A simple but wonderful structure but after an introductory year, based the second year on the village, the third year on a small town, the fourth year on a district in the city, always London, and the fifth year was devoted to thesis. Building problems were then situated in or derived from exploratory plans for the renewal of these settlements. I would attribute my lasting belief and enthusiasm for design on the city and, and, and its reciprocal relationship with architecture from this grounding. Thank you, James. By the mid-1960s, the scene, the, the steam, had run out of this post-war initiative and reconstruction. And as the built production of this era came into its public consumption, a certain fallibility began to emerge. It could be said that we're still living through the disillusionment of this rude awakening. Indeed, it could also be said that by the mid-1960s, cracks were more than apparent in the monolith of the modern city. It was therefore no coincidence that the Brussels architecture of the city of 1967 and the development of Colin Rose Urban Design Studio circa 1965 in Ithaca onwards should have areas of shared territory. So as a group, we did not steal a march on history, but I'll return to this later. On the left, we have Park Hill Sheffield, built by um, the Corporation of Sheffield, designed by Ida Smith, probably for all the good intentions, following the lead of the Team Ten's early directives. And on the right, we have Coronation Day in the Bylaw Street. The social divisiveness of large public housing estates with site plans requiring guidebooks for navigation through their unnecessary, complicated, and unique labyrinths, I refer to Park Hill. High-rise apartment buildings, both families once familiar with life in the Bylaw Street on the right. These were feelings that we as a group, I think, were having. Buildings that negate the old time hallowed relationship and convention between street and block, front and back. Buildings that later became subject to researches of the likes of American Oscar Newman and his book Defensible Space of 1972, with painfully obvious con conclusions. These criticisms with the wisdom of hindsight are by now rather obvious. From the mid-1960s onwards, it became apparent to my generation that a position of critical resistance was necessary and that alterations of a rather blunt and direct kind had to be found. It no longer seemed reasonable to destroy perfectly sound 19th century urban terraces and substitute with something which resembled the aftermath of a train crash. Each time we saw a demolition team at work, we knew that something inferior was to take its place. This was not a comfortable time to be an architect. The schools by the late 60s offered instruction in anything but architecture. Brian Anderson had converted his studio in Bedford Square into a rifle range. The street farmers had plans for plowing up the Tottenham Court Road, and the architecture of di diversion had arrived through the example of Archigram. The, the socially responsible era 
while the period of the architecture of good intentions had finally come to a close, 1968. This is never more fully expressed than by the blowing up of the Prague Eyewear housing development in St. Louis in 1972, or as on the right on this slide in 1968 in aid on the failure of Roman Point in London. I think Ron Heron's working or floating city and the lack of gravity in that slide makes not an uninteresting con comparison. And so to this position of critical resistance. If a previous generation had become obsessed with the architecture and society of the modern city, we came to the not altogether unpredictable conclusion that modern architecture, whilst producing some very remarkable freestanding buildings, had been made to be less successful in its relationship to the traditional city. It might be said that this observation has underwritten my teaching and practice in my present partnership with Jeremy Dixon from that moment, beginning of the 1970s, to the present. I'll speak more about this later. And so looking retrospectively to the period of the Blunt group, group, so 1963 to 73, when I went out of the AA and when Northampton Pyramid competition was won, by Jeremy Dixon, or 1965 to 75, in any event, say 10 or 12 years. I look from the present in my own partnership now with Jeremy, um, and it could be said that things have gone full, full circle. I know few partners who uh, drift apart and come back together. I think we have a kind of uh, I do think we have a march on history there. It's, it, 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 it doesn't happen very often. And um, I have begun with some slides which will show where we have been in the 1990s, which is 30 years looking backwards. This is our Venice competition of 1991, um, which I wrote described in detail, suffice to say that it is a, ve a very large circle of 112 meters, which Sterling, who was on the jury, made the point that there were 50% of the entries were either tiles, meaning uh, a circle, I guess, or stripes. And he said we did, we held the line with the circle, which I would say looking back to a certain obsessiveness within our own work in the earlier days was to take ideas to the limit and hold the line. So in the Venice entry, many, many circles, but contaminated frequently. Our interest here was to hold the secretary, this massive turbine, and to allow the flats and, and deliberations around the edge to act as counterpoint to the machine of the station itself. And also, just very recently, can repeated in Aberdeen, two tires, um, a circular tire and a square tire. I think there was never any doubt that when when we had begun our work, Jeremy, myself, and David Mason's on this project, that one would, one would be circular and the other would be square. The circular tower acting as a kind of lighthouse on the River D, um, a common one on the top looking out across the crown of the trees, and the more convivial building within the interior of the site. It's not my intention this evening to describe these buildings in detail. But these are very pink buildings. Uh, they're made of harling, and we found ourselves stumbling upon the coincidence that tower houses in Scotland have been built quite extensively in this area. That was not the motive for doing the project in the first place. The motive was to situate uh, an, an abstract in 
building in, in terms of the circular building, in a more referential building in terms of the square building, on site of extreme beauty where footprint had to be minimal. So I will start to go back in time now. Um, I was impressed in Jeremy's talk in that he has a marvelous ability, I think, to bounce around through time. I'm going to be more stolid and deal with chronology a little bit. I will move, I will now go back in time and move forward. And <coughs> now I'll call the period immediately after the Blood Group period, which I would say concluded in 1977 as the transitional period. Um, there's a period in Canada, which I'll be very brief about, and a period present in practice with Germany. That makes four quarters of rather unequal duration. I think this is a slide that we probably will show. So back, so back to the work. Um, this is page 346 of AD 1972, and it is the closest I ever think we came to a manifesto or polemic. Um, Robert Maxwell observed in 1971, writing retrospectively about, I think, Chris's housing thesis at the AA of 1964, and I quote, cool architecture is now making a decided re-entry. In place of romantic and frenzied silhouettes, the rational calm envelope, cool diagrams, subject price, coolness, in all circumstances, a renewed interest in, rash in rationality and rational frameworks, a Mesian caste. This coolness is decidedly Dutch in tone, uncompromising in riot, but tender in detail. <coughs> Thank you, Bob. Uh, <laughs> Um, somehow this drawing on the left could have been drawn by one hand, it was drawn by Dallas Orwell. I think it's one of our collective drawings. Um, platonic forms standing about in nature bathed in endless sunshine. Um, Amy P. Smith's site plan for Churchill College competition of 1957 was influential. That I attribute to the knowingness of what the way cards are drawn and buildings are, are, are placed. We also credit our sponsors, as you will notice, in this rather arrogant and small type. <laughs> The exploratory housing projects from 1965 onwards, entitled by critics of the time to be low-rise, high, high density, were attempts to revalue the urban house to avoid nationalistic sentiment in proposals for mass housing. The form was frequently described as Welsh fishing villages. Here, the good intentions of townscape, encouraged by the AR editorial of the day, and I'm now referring to Portsmouth, called for mixed developments of tar, tarla and terrace, tar as campanile or church, terrace as fabric. Montpazier on the right, a finite bastide town set in French countryside. And so to Portsdown, 1965, done by Mike, Mike Gold and myself under the, the patronage and support of Michael Bourne with Paul Simpson. The year that Corbusier died, a finite settlement of 1,500 people, the population of a unitary Dabatassian, um, Passing a management of a well on the right, steamed by corpse that was to do with establishing Catalan vaults, setting down a hillside. Our site is was dramatically sloped. And again, 
a preoccupation here, whether it's the Basque time, whether it's a unitary mode on its side, the building is quite finite and quite complete with the fort of Portsdown sitting above it and, and, the, and, and the main paths going towards it. The fort on the left, looking over the shoulder of this um, precise crystalline Mike likes to describe it as, I didn't see it as crystalline as he did, um, with passageways moving down the hill in its time to the pointer. <coughs> uh, these are simple houses. But, um, very direct thoughts about parking a car walking down a passageway on the incline and getting into a house that, as you can see, uses the road, the next one, um, in front of it as terrace or garden. Um, one of those things of coincidence was when Mike and I were teaching in Cornell in 1973, someone, one of our students, I think, kept pulling us by the car, saying, please come and see this thing on the hill outside Ithaca. Um, Portstown has been built, and Werner Seligman, uh, in his Elm Street housing project for the UDC in 1972, built Portstown. And then one might then be charitable and say, the idea is pretty obvious. Um, but it was okay to, to find a very similar project built in America. The Woolwich Polytechnic Hostel. This is the McManus project that I worked on with Brendan Woods. We began this as a group. I think we made a model of this in Doughty Street. Jeremy, Chris, Mike, and myself, before we um, surreptitiously started to take over the office a little bit. We, we, we would invite our friends there to come and work, and by the end there were, I think, 40 people in the office, 25 of whom were working with us on these various projects. Um, I think Chris had the insight to, to, to see that it was a, a rather well-intentioned office with a large amount of work, and uh, uh, we're desperately looking for people to work on it. Um, the antecedents to this project are probably too obvious to go into. Um, as far as to say that we were involved in pre were producing 250 identical rooms. I mean, it's a thing that the Aberdeen project makes a virtue of, of, of the difference of, of room and its prospect. In this case, they all face south. They are painfully democratic. Um, the model was very much a unitary single room hotel model. The room was just six feet wide, 20 feet long. A full scale mock up was made, and the newfound ordinariness of own and white painted abstract furniture was part of the decor. Set above a ground floor that was open, egalitarian, any possibility might emerge there. Um, a phrase remains in my mind, which was a separate price phrase of well-serviced and nobility being a kind of uh, a possibility for urban life versus the most spurious social engineering of groups like eight is terrific and 12 is really a problem. So a value kind of view of the building, the, these slides are taken not recently as I gather Chris in a kind of brutally frank mode showed the buildings as they are now. These slides were shot relatively soon after the building was finished. Um, the corridor lit from 
the side, a window facing the well slab above the common ground. The south facing wall, sure, uncompromising. And in a curious way, there was something that Jeremy mentioned last, last week. Um, he pointed out that many of these projects began with a whopping kind of arbitrary move. I mean, the, the fact that they should all be south facing uh, single aspect, single loaded corridor, was a kind of whopping arbitrary move. Having made that move, all well, the subsequent moves were then uh, trying to avoid the arbitrary, to make things as precise, as mechanistically pure and simple as one could make it, and not um, have recourse to whimsy and um, to us at the time, I think, rather reprehensible townscape sentiment. Revolution is in the air. We're talking now 1970. Um, this was a thing we all did. Chris and, and, and Jerry built the thorough and ambitious um, Tatlin Tower. Mike and myself built the Prado Tower as, I suppose, an expression of love for the building. We had a great affection for this building. It did not have anything like the um, secret key and complexity of, of the Tatlin Tower, as Jeremy described last, last week. Our only problem here was that there were only black and white images of the building given to us in the original Vesman Baba drawing on the left. So we sort of created, I think, a, a moral stir in the art world by deciding that we would rewrite history by claiming that the window frames were red. And this nearly caused a major upset at the Art and Revolution exhibition at the Hayward in 1970, where the late Cable Gray arrived at our stand where the model was being put in place and saying that they would never have done the window frames red. It was a sort of major row. We had made an arbitrary de decision. A more accurate grunt would actually have been to build a monochrome model. We, 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 we fell from grace, and this was the moment when the, the, the resistance prune room was being shut down, and there was a lot of, 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 of sort of Kremlin marching around the corridors of the Hayward Gallery at this time. So that's a sort of calling card. It's now has this model in, surprise, surprise, the Sainsbury Gallery in uh, UEA, and made a number of journeys to Moscow, curiously, I mean to Paris, the Moscow Paris show, and I believe is in still good shape. I have to mention the pages. I mean, this is, a fairly critical thing, um, this conversation Jeremy and I had before his talk last week, that somehow the layout of these pages were absolutely critical. This is the AD of 1972. This is Mike's Clipson Street on the left, Chris and Mike, Chris and Jeremy's Runcorn project of, I forget the date, 60, 68. What you'll notice here is a capacity in a double-page spell to explain the entire project. Uh, the section in both cases is quite important. In Clipson Street, it goes through the workshop, through the crowd, critical, important, I, I, the at one point, it goes through a number of these straight terraces. The model finds its place in either page a diagrammatic draw of the um, um, essential layout, uh, an elevation, 
a small amount of text, a tiny amount of text, just facts. Um, no hyperbole, I suppose, except the word out. Um, and if I want to refer to sources, I guess Roth's my architecture book was influential. And also Max Bill again for about the third time this evening in his lines for the Earth Complet of Cord. And so to Milton Keynes, we didn't arrive by a helicopter, but we, we could have done. Um, a piece of very reasonable uh, Buckinghamshire countryside that the government, in its wisdom, decided to turn into a new town. I think Milton Keynes as a name is something to do with the economic axis between Birmingham and London, uh, to do with Keynes, and Milton being something to do with the axis between Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, Milton Keynes stands uneasily between those four centres. Um, we were invited by Dave Walker as a, as a group um, to design the first major scheme there, and what is described uh, here is the Leatherfield scheme and the area of operation we were given, which is four kilometers, I, I think, as a city project. And in the context of the girls that may separate us from the last 30 years, that was quite a normal brief to be given as young architects coming out of school, cutting their teeth on building schemes that were the size of an entire town. So we took to it with relish. Um, of course, the first thing we had to do was see, well, you put the entire accommodation, which is only housing for I forget what the numbers are. Chris, do you, do you have a mem memory of the numbers? Yeah. What? 3,000 3, dwellings. 3, people. people. 3,000 people in one, in one building seem to be a very important first, so to speak, grant group start <laughs> to see what that might be about. So there are some slides that show speculations on this, this kilometer square to see what we were dealing with. Algiers project my court on the left, where one has a similar notion of a, a pre-unitary building at the scale of a piece of geography, a piece of countryside. Um, there's a kind of resonance in the slide on the right of um, uh, Robin Hood Gardens, no, not Robin Hood Gardens, uh, the Smithson Golden Lane project multiplied by to the power of 10. Um, Hill, Hill, Hildesheimer's Berlin project of 1927 as a, a kind of way of seeing how to deal with the massive scale of operation. Um, what, uh, sorry, the two Vibrax projects of core are a building that is not governed by a flat ground plane, but will react to the ground plane by its uh, clear geometry. And on the right, uh, sorry, on the go back, on the right were collages that we made at the time using uh, Primrose Hill, I think it was, as uh, a ground against which we would set the uh, rigorous geometry of these terraces. Now, we produced a drawing, and I managed to find it the other day, which was a, in, in, in pieces. It was a drawing that was 30 feet long. It somehow had uh, attacked the problem of the double page spell then there was an equal way of being able to present the project uh, in, on the longest piece of paper one could think of. So we drew this drawing in the basement of number 10 Percy Street, coincidentally where Jeremy and I are presently in practice, in the basement, uh, because we found it rather difficult to work in Milton Keynes. We were given a yellow internal box to work in. 
uh, in the middle of the countryside. We found that not a tolerable experience. So we, we, we set up our architectural practice monkey in the basement of Percy Street and made this drawing. Now, the section starts to play apart. I think that's when we go on to the next two slides. But what this does show is the, uh, the scale of the operation. These are villages. This is the scale that is quite mind-blowing to think about now. There's an iconography starting to show up in the section of the structuralist um, setting. Um, one of the islands, I think this drawing, is that the very or Hampton Pyramid is shown in India. This is before competitions won by Germany, which we all worked on. And that's the important thing to come. This is going to part the same scale of the uh, piece of land we're, we're looking at. Um, suffice to say that what we were using here was virtual existing field patterns to moderate the uh, ruthlessness and nationality of the layout. So this is a drawing going on all the type plans which are laid out to reflect the fact, as you can see on the section on the bottom, that the buildings go from three stories to two stories to one. I think we had four, one, four stories at one time with an absolutely constant roof line, and the point of the section on the top is to show that when the, as it were, the east-west set, the roof is constant. And I think the general one well pointed out last, last week was that the primary impetus in this project was sculptural, um, with a great naivete about human settlement and the requirements of it. Countryside, single story house, I'll go through these quickly, two story house, three story house, the backs were timber, the fronts were corrugated metal. I think something to do with sitting in cars going up the motorway looking at, pan looking at very large trucks driving beside you. Um, with then fins and uh, dividers on the front plane that created the abstraction of the terrace when seen in perspective. A centre, what is shown here, in construction, a large monumental um, arcade with quite a small scale shop at its back, again broken by the hedgerow. And so, out of Milton Keynes, um, I would say the following projects are a reaction to that scale. We're talking now about 1972-73's competition that Mike Gold and I did in Haringey called the Backlands. We called it the Backlands Project. It was building in allotment gardens, a completely different shift in scale. Um, a way of reclaiming and appropriating land that had been lost. And this was a competition for old, pe old person's housing. Um, taking a tight plan, running it rigorously around the boundary, and in a sense then owning up to the shape that one then found left over. Um, an idea of lowering the front, an orientation of this house, um, a definite front and a definite back. Um, and a scale that uh, is really, really all per shape. I think that's the end, actually. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no
this is Sarah's in Sarah's, not my not my control, actually. Last Haraz. I think of the Milton Keynes project. Um, Neon, Neon Crea made the point that it was disgusting and promiscuous building. Jim, Jim Sterling made the point, I think, when he visited the Yellow Bugs, that it was a bit much. Um, but I have to admit that Waterfield was a project we all worked on. I think it's the only project we all worked on. So it could be said there's comfort in, there's comfort in numbers. So what I'm trying to show now is a certain agri agrophobia, a, a wish to start to look at a scale of building that, that is not um, implicitly given us as a belief by an authority um, at a scale that we don't understand. Um, little problem on the right. Yes, slightly dark. Uh, is that the right slide? No, no, that's not the right slide. Or well, I think just go forward because I've done this. I've done this project. No, keep going. It seems to be the bulb's gone, probably. What? Right? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, go forward on the left. Do I think we've lost the bulb? Go, go forward on the left. Go forward. Uh -oh. Oh. Well, keep going. Okay. Um, is there something to be done about the phone? I'm not sure I'm going to figure that out. Oh, okay. Um, well, I've often wondered what would happen if, if I dropped all of the slides. I gather something would happen to is Sasaki in this room. I wonder what it would be like to have one slightly, <laughs> slightly gone away, but not quite. So there's a, there's a sort of moment of one could ask for your patience, I suppose. But what you see on the right, I think, um, is a bit evidence in the drawing on the left. Um, This is the uh, Cranford Lane housing project that I did for the number of Hounslow, and it was really using the model that Mike and I had developed in Haringey and applying it to a more um, regular site to make a small courtyard uh, filled with trees um, with a peristyle and pergola around its edge. Um, this, the appearance of this project um, is very much sort of mid, mid thirties stuccoed into more kind of building. Its plan type is quite ancient. Um, so that one might say in this, in the scheme one is attempting to reconcile for the first time the issue of figural space, the contained space, but the appearance of modern architecture. <coughs> Should I proceed or uh, with the left? I'll continue on the left. Um, just after it was built. Um, there are two or three projects I'll show them very, very quickly, which is where this inquisitiveness starts to get into the world, which is beginning to abandon the, that arbitrary first move of utter supposed rash, rash, rationality and start to look at plans more from the point of view of, of the city and 
the expectation of certain typologies to start to recognize urban types, the hybrid building, the terrace, uh, the, 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 urban, the urban house. This is a competition for, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> It's a bold piece of artwork. For this uh, problem, we've got another projector coming. I hope you'll just bear with us. I mean, fraught with tech. We haven't had any problems at all with this series until this evening, and um, somehow, maybe it's because it's the end. I don't know.
to your organizations. Um, I will try to work very quickly uh, if you put the lights down, but um, through, through the middle section of these, these slides, I said that this is a um, reformation going, going on, and I don't really want to drop all the I's and cross the T's of, of uh, this journey. Um, but this is, 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 is the City Keys project in Dublin, but I didn't really do it as an entry. I sent it as a letter to Hay Beck at the AD at the time as a kind of protest um, by observing Dublin, and that's where Vanilla uh, Dixon, um, Mike, Chris, and myself taught for two or three years, so we have a great affection for Dublin and taught uh, from about 1970 to 1973. Um, a project in, in, in Bristol that I did with Margaret Griffin, uh, which is housing another competition, in this case, a, a pattern of streets, a series of types, uh, a competition for the Royal Mint with Michael Gold, uh, reception of the street, uh, Reception of common gardens and terraces, uh, beginning to look and make observations on, on the city that one was living in. Um, in a sense, this was seen as radical and extreme. I think Jeremy made a point to his lecture last, last week, the last road, was the only terrace housing project built in London, probably since the 30s and was seen as radical and extreme. This was seen as radical and extreme. Oh, there was the notion of a much bigger house in which a number of apartments might happen. This was a Shinkin Shinku Shinku competition of about 1976. <coughs> uh, looking for places to live, the rooftops. This is Earl Street where we all worked between 1973 and 77, and Mike and I sitting at night one night thought it was a rather big site sitting right on top of us. So we speculated on making the thing we call the rooftop housing with the extraordinary view of the city of Westminster and the London as a romantic city from the fourth or fifth floor. Uh, the project went rather a long way. We got a client, Chris Cross, worked on it also. Uh, I think this is Chris's drawing on the left, which was uh, finding another way of dealing with this rooftop, a, 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 a kind of modest courtyard building. Um, with, I think that's the upper house you're seeing through the window over, over the head of Corpse Park, or one shot. Um, finally, when I left the public realm, in this project almost exclusively. This was a studio in Chelsea, um, in a blue, in blue place. Uh, a remarkable part of London where most of the back gardens are covered in glass because that's where I thought that they have an enthusiasm for horticulture, but there were a lot of painters in this area. And I had a client who requested that we looked at a big stable in blue, in blue place of course, the first thing that happened, but the roof fell down, the building actually fell to pieces. Um, this was to build, in a sense, a heroic modern building. If we couldn't do them in the street, we would do them under wraps. We did it inside the building. So this is a, very much a building within a building, uh, a heroic piece of architecture, modern architecture, within the shell of a large stable. Um, I won't bore you with all the details. First, say that there's a large studio, a big north, north, north light, a kind of ideal uh, possibility of life in the city, uh, a painter, a bedroom on the ground floor, and above uh, a place for parties. I think again, Peter Cook said the studio was the possibility of a place in the city that represented great comfort and luxury. Um, 
מדברים על אינגו אלן כהוא פיזמוקלייזד עם אקספרשן אסימטוטיק ג'אנקשן עם בוט און און דה לפט, which is a number of lines meeting at one particular point, like the balcony. Moving to the first, the first floor, uh, keeping the very long wall of the studio in the pack, a tiny kitchen, a place to sit, which is where the slide on, on the left is faced, taking the roof off the building at the back and making a good garden. So it might be said this is the closest I ever got to making uh, a project in the spirit of one's truly formative experiences with the whole period of modern architecture. It was typically inside and out of sight. These are not working, yes, that's really that. The long, high stained glass window that had the effect of throwing new and red lines across the walls of the studio at a particular hour of the day. Uh, this is an idea that I, I find I'm indebted to some of the imaginative thinking in the, North, in the Northampton pyramid of, of coincidence and time and color. Now, I show these slides up now because I take the, the Nobel competition, 1976 to 77, as a moment of public declaration and demonstration of our imagined differences. A certain parallel might be observed. Jeremy and Dave Bell were to comment on certain London housing traditions which would culminate in, in the St. Mark's Road project. Chris and Owens, Chris and Owens which were to see more no bank in a wider urban setting. I think Chris chuckled that this had aspects of Basil Spence about it. I'm not too clear about that. Um, Mike and Mary Machado it sees the symbolic nature of the crown as landowner as a justification for a Sherbatian car, crowned, so to speak. Um, the more moment in the development of his project, um, I remember Mike explaining, Christ, I've done a seafoot, um, which is something to do with resemblances to center point. I'd like to say that this was a moment that the building was going through its probably its most unpopular period. And so Mike, in a rather characteristic way, was lifting the finger and going against the tide. And for myself, uh, not proud at this moment, um, a typological, an abstract, uh, of urban architecture. Other conversations followed, mostly through teaching, many com and many competitions. Jeremy and Mike were now running minutes of the OA, and Chris and myself were teaching under the inspired direction of John Miller at the Royal College of Art. However, by 1973 and 76, going back a little bit now, um, I found myself teaching a studio in Cornell, next door to Colin Miller's Urban Design Studio. The half semester I spent in Ithaca, only one exchange with CR, beyond that we never spoke. You see, I had been invited with Michael Gold by Matthias Ungers, and he wasn't speaking to Colin Roy, and Colin Roy wasn't speaking to Matthias Ungers. And Matthias had been impressed by our earlier, how can I put it, Germanic elementarist housing projects. On this fateful occasion, Roy stumbled into one of my crits and pronounced, Oh, I see, here we have the architecture and general welfare state. We were doing a housing project in the Bronx, no, in Brooklyn, I think, no, in Brooklyn, on the 
short tales of another chance for housing, which was a, a project run by the UDC. Um, and for me, this was a turning point. Mike thinks the World Fair Island competition did it about the same, the same date, where we sort of couldn't, sort of, sort of couldn't deliver with, with, with our architectural good, in, good intentions and elementary slab for a new world context. But for me, this did it. Money on Colin Rowe. And, coinc and coincidentally with this crisis, it might be said that a new agenda was in, emerging in my own work. A revaluing of the city and interest in landscape and the garden and park as an architectural and urban paradigm. Rather than the abstract juxtaposition of fun and nature, as in the earlier schemes, the following projects in Dublin, in Berlin, with men and Toronto, mostly with Marlon Griffin, were to re-establish the architectural project in the city, or to establish the, the garden or park as an extension of the architectural territory and composition. You see, modern architecture killed the garden, and the park was a non-event. Um, and I think this observation, it would be disingenuous not to attribute this to, to Colin Rowe. I will go quickly through these projects. It's reliance to what I described the, tra the transitional period. Uh, this wasn't one of them, but that is my dog, um, Boswell, who who was a great character and in, uh, in the habits of the purest interiors with great kind of fortitude. Uh, he seemed uh, looking through these, this sort of, um, you know, this well, pure interior where Margaret and I used to do projects in Notting Hill Gate. This is a little studio we built for ourselves through, through the patronage of Andrew von Preussen brother of the client of the other studio house. Here we did uh, the tea shop competition uh, in Phoenix Park. I think lots of people did it. Uh, Margo and I did the competition more as a challenge to Aldo Van Eyck, that old workhorse of Team 10 who was on the jury. We did it not to win, we did it to shake a fist at him. And uh, the garden, the extraordinary um, possibility in Phoenix Park and on the site for the tea shops house uh, was an opportunity to engage in a full-blooded way this new interest, uh, reawakened interest in the garden and, uh, and, and the architectural project. Um, Many, many references, many visits to gardens at this time. Jeremy introduced me to Reichen. Um, one remembers still as a schoolboy. Uh, I think I played cricket there. Um, the park suddenly became part of, and the garden became part of an architectural composition. <coughs> I won't describe the project in any detail. I will go through the fragments, the plan, an incomplete plan made up of garden elements and building elements, um, a house for the tea shop, a house for parties, a house for guests. Russell Beddington worked on this project with Margot and, and myself. You can um, see a certain big gym influence in, in the worm's eye drawings of fragments of this project that Russell drew. By 1980, Schinkel was, was a kind of buzzword in schools, this, and in, 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 in profession in general. Um, to, discover, to, discover Schinkel, to discover Schinkel was, a, a, again, a fairly uh, fundamental experience. Jeremy ran this project at the AA, I ran it at the RCA with Chris, and Margaret and I did a project together on this archive for Schinkel, situated next to the pavilion for Schinkel by the Schwarzenberg Palace on the River Spree. The slide on the right is a description of, of, of 
the site we were asked to look at. Things hatched are debris and demolition from World War II. The bridge is a GI, a Bailey Bridge. Um, the building was here, it was there. No the site was anywhere around here. Uh, I think Taz is here. Did, did you do this project, Taz? Come on. Uh, I never quite finished. Ah. <laughs> we were preoccupied with the plan, weren't we, at the time? We were, yeah. Well, not to overdo the description here, I think it's quite clear. We made an island, we repaired the bridge, we looked at the typology of courtyard building housing, we restored this piece of the city. Uh, the brief was tiny for the building, the archives for Schenkel were very small, but the implications of the project were very refreshingly broad and involved entrances to a very large park, a public building, a repair of a fabric, uh, cere ceremonial woods, gardens. It was a lovely project, and um, I have a great affection for it. Observations in the remains of this church that is actually built on the, at Glinica, that was built, attached to a bank that looked like something that was actually an island, confirmed in our minds, in my in my mind, that the idea of the project being an island, a kind of repository of these precious artifacts of the Schinkel was a kind of an appropriate gesture for the building, which in itself was a very uh, simple project. Its um, possibilities were quite ambitious. Yes, this was the go at the Jolly Green Giant. We'll go past that one. Uh, to Toronto to make a garden. Um, in the Backlands, again, the sort of Backlands project, right up against Eaton Centre, which is one of the biggest arcade buildings you can find anywhere. This was an interest in making the garden. There was no program here. Uh, it's, it's as far as one ever got to doing a project without any program and no uh, buildings. This is entirely to do with walls, with trees, with hedges, with banks, um, with berms, as they call them there, um, and triage as a kind of secret garden buried in the middle of a Toronto block. I now run rather quickly through three projects which I'll call collision projects. They're projects that, that took an interest in making an identity of each piece of program and setting it up in relationship to the world beyond itself and see what the consequences of that strategy might be to make an architecture of almost of the urban block out of the program. And in this case, it's a city hall for West Hollywood, uh, enormous dependence on the motor car and uh, the baseball diamond and a lot of cultural things that I'm not so familiar with. Um, and a project in Canada for the clay and glass, and this is again taking aspects of the project rather small building to extend its field into the park, into across a, a piece of water to conceptualize the car park as something in the composition which is something that Jamie and I worked on in the Northampton period. This is a kind of memory of that. And looking forward to, I think, both our interests presently in dealing with car parks. We're getting, we're, we're getting interested in car parks. Let's go forward. The, the, in the interior, each of these pieces the fronting piece and the ramp is set up by the car park, the long gallery building set up by the lake, and the other twisted geometry set up by a wish to make the park in a certain way, then glued together then in a way that doesn't come out of um, the rational dictates of grids and total coordination. Let's go forward. <laughs> 
the Mississauga City Hall. Um, a competition that I won in 1982 and took me out of this country for seven years, which we built uh, as the city in miniature, you might say, um, with no city around it at all, except a very large car park, a lot of uh, abandoned agricultural land, a kind of subtopia emerging and menacingly going towards it, and a kind of final grunt on this on this asylum was, was to make a site plan, deliver it to the mayor, and tell her how she could make a beautiful city, given that she'd commissioned a city hall. Suffice to say that uh, the car park have stood the test of time. They are still there. Um, the building, I think, is surrounded by other kinds of architecture now, not the streets and squares that one might have wished for it. Getting very close to the end. This is a car park that Jeremy and I have done in Plymouth that um, is for Sainsbury's. Uh, and this building is being built now. Um, it's a building we worked on with Peter Rice before he sat for nearly two years ago this, this summer. Uh, it's a project that I think in a curious way summarizes some of the earlier impulses, I think, in um, what we loosely describe as grunt group work, which is to push an idea to the limit of the site. There's a long arcade here, which is 240 meters long, 800 cars in this big theatrical car park set against a railway line, a flyover, a river, an estuary, a hill, geographical features at very large scale. And this is Jeremy's drawing on the left, which is to is an observation on how Sainsbury's stories are worked. And one could say this is us playing a sleight of hand on the program. But the entrance to Sainsbury is always in the corner. And when you then work that out with the site plan, you find the door then is at the center of the circle. Um, and the scale of the building itself, at six meters high, would never deal with the scale of operation of um, the communication systems that lasso this particular site. So the arcade itself is autonomous, separate from the building, 16 meters high, cost a million pounds, and has no function whatsoever. So I might say that the sculptural excesses in the earlier work are now grounded and rooted in something that can be described as late Thatcherite commercialism, but um, it's a project at the scale of a very large piece of territory. Let's go forward. Um, this is the four of us sitting having lunch in rules in Cotton Garden at the moment that we went public, so to speak, and became a practice. Um, one thing I think we were always very good at was having lunch. Um, always enjoy having lunch. Um, I have some concluding comments, which I will now make. I would hope that you might have detected a course or direction in all of this notwithstanding some extreme swings of the pendulum, it might be called the architecture of oscillation. On one hand, I have much appreciation of my minimalist and high-tech colleagues who venture on in an accumulative fashion. By accumulative, I mean that details are refined and improved, and they get better at it. We might raise questions about the city, but then we would, wouldn't we? On the other hand, I feel so sustained by urban design as a basis for architecture, but each time I make a building, 
it always seems to be as though one is approaching a problem uniquely and for the first time. Maybe this is an important aspect of the grand group sensibility. As long as one does not see it, separated by an unbridgeable gulf, with something trapped in a decade all those years ago, which I do not. As we approach the end of the century, there seems to be a lot of retrospection going on. I attended Peter Smithson's retros retrospective talk last month at the Building Center, in which one was perplexed and impressed in equal measure by his ability not to repeat himself. But then I was reminded of his memorable observation on Wheatfeld in his heroic period of modern architecture, AD 1965, I think a volume that underwrites a lot of what I've shown you this evening. And I quote, Wheatfeld continues to work quietly in New Retract, a modest man who says of his greatest work, it was an experiment. I never did it again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edward. That's wonderful. Um, we have just a few moments. Would you take a question?